everybody, I'm Robert Donovan. Welcome to this episode of 21st Century Treconomics, formerly known as Not Treconomics. Post-scarcity, zero poverty, and no more pursuit of pure monetary gain have long been staples of Star Trek canon. Of course, exactly how all of that is achieved is never explained, because the Star Trek writers didn't have any more idea of how to do that than they had of how to build a warp drive. What if I could show you a way we could humanely dismantle the welfare state, end poverty, and make work optional for everybody using nothing more than capital formation and compounding? Let's do some 21st century Treconomics. All right, first we need to define poverty. The thing you need to understand about poverty is that wealth is a spectrum going from poverty to post-satiation. I'm setting the poverty line for purposes of this discussion at the minimum income required to pay for the physiological and safety needs in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I call that the Maslow minimum. Below the Maslow minimum, you're in poverty. Above the Maslow minimum, just above it, if you're right at it, you're a little bit above it, you're the working poor. As your income goes up where you're saving regularly, you become the working class, the working middle class. And as your passive income from your investments gets to the point where it can cover your Maslow minimum, you are at minimal survival financial independence. I call it post-subsistence. You could quit your job, you wouldn't starve, you wouldn't go homeless, you would be able to put gas in your car and look for another job, but you would take a severe downgrade in your lifestyle and you would need to find another job to keep saving and get your investment income to grow to the point where it covers 100% of your current living expenses. That is your living expenses above the Maslow minimum where most people live. That would put you at 100% financial independence as your income grew to the point where you could use your passive income to cover any standard of living you want. You hit post satiation. So that's the basic spectrum that I am using. The goal here is that nobody be poorer than post subsistence. We want to get that to be the poverty line with high income mobility. Once you get everybody to post subsistence, you are at zero systemic poverty. The thing that's important about post subsistence is that that's the minimum point on the income scale where more money starts to become about standard of living and security against future unexpected expenses more than just about bare survival. So if you're just at post-subsistence, yeah, you're still largely concerned about money because you're just scraping by. But the farther above that you get, the more important to your happiness become the love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization slash self-transcendence needs in Maslow's hierarchy. And if you don't believe that the mere security and high standard of living are not essential to your happiness... Ask yourself if any rich celebrity who died of a drug overdose or committed suicide would agree with the statement that the top needs are more important even if they didn't have all that money and all that high standard of living. The thing about those needs in the top three tiers, though, is that they are paid for with things other than money. Things like honesty, integrity, loyalty, devotion, responsibility, and self-discipline. Those things are important at the bottom tiers of Maslow's hierarchy, too, but they become of primary importance as you get into those top three levels. Now, in the U.S. and other countries, one of the things about poverty programs is that they tend to take the form of a welfare state, if not outright, socialism. And among the many, many flaws in the welfare state and socialism, perhaps the biggest one is that they reward persistent need and they punish demonstrated improvement, creating what is known as the welfare cliff. A single welfare mom needs to earn between 30000 and 65000 to buy all the services she gets as cash or in-kind income at no cost to her from welfare. But if she earns anything over $12,000 or acquires assets and savings greater than, say, between three and 10000 depending on what kind of asset and what state she lives in, all those benefits will go away. Not letting the poor earn or save prevents them from ever accumulating a capital base that could support them and traps them in poverty and dependency. This is actually one of the few things, about the only thing, that the universal basic income, as proposed by Andrew Yang, gets right. Gets everything else wrong, and it costs way too much money. The UBI does at least not hamstring you when you hit a certain income. It doesn't take the benefit away. 
Everything else about it is screwed up, but that's the one good point in the UBI. So what we need to do with welfare to fix this, we need to change how we set the incentives up. You need to show sufficient need to get on welfare, but if you do not show subsequent demonstrated improvement after a certain amount of time, then the benefits will be gradually reduced unless you can show a mental or physical disability. Tax cuts and encouragement of entrepreneurship are the other way we try to tackle poverty, along with savings incentives like IRAs and 401ks and low capital gains rates. Those reward improvement via individual effort very well, except there's a problem with them. They tend to reward those most who already have assets, income, or access to debt. Low-income earners, especially in high-cost-of-living areas, also have the problem that they simply cannot afford to lock up income for decades in savings or IRAs or any of these and still meet many of their living expenses. And I'm not talking about luxuries here. I'm talking about basic things like rent and food, and they can't borrow easily at low interest. Since they're also already in the lowest tax brackets, tax breaks don't help them very much. So the solution here, suppose... We had a retirement account. You could call it a universal capital base or a personal income and retirement account or because when you put freedom in front of anything, it makes a better headline, a financial freedom account or a freedom account because actually in this case, that's exactly what you'd be buying with this particular account. It would work like this. You can put as much money into this account each year as you want, but you got to pay taxes on what you put in. At the end of the year, you may withdraw up to and only up to 5% of the equity in the account. You may do it tax-free. You are penalized if you go over 5%, withdraw outside the window at the end of the year where withdrawals are allowed, or you borrow against your Freedom Account funds. Big penalties for all of those because we want you to leave that stuff in there at a retirement that you don't take out at the end of the year. Legal title would go to the individual, not the government. They can be set up by any licensed broker or financial advisor, so you'll have competition there and they won't be able to gouge you on fees. And they could be passed on to heirs tax-free. As these accounts grew, you'd be taking out 5% of a bigger and bigger number over time, and the withdrawals would effectively act as a tax-free raise that grows with the account. They could then displace work and welfare income over time which creates very convenient income mobility because any other income stream you get, you just put that money into that account and your 5% withdrawals get bigger. You're buying yourself a raise every year, basically. Simple, easy to use, works at any income level, and it creates direct incentives to work and save. So how could we use this to dismantle the welfare state? Let's start with the elephant running around the room in terms of unfunded obligations and just about everything else the Bismarckian social security system, that wonderful Ponzi scheme posing as a retirement system. All you'd have to do to displace or replace the current social security system with accounts like this is set a legal minimum retirement age and a legal minimum equity. Start with the young crowd. Everybody under 45 has to contribute 10% of their annual income to a freedom account, and that includes the self-employed. And I said 10% of annual income, not 10% a month. People who run small businesses, particularly when they're starting out, they could have five or six months where they're making money, two or three months where they're losing money, and then the rest of the time they're somewhere break-even slightly negative, break-even slightly positive. You never know which kind of month it's going to be until it's over. But if you had to contribute 10% a month, most self-employed people would find that very tough to do. As far as I'm concerned, if you put it all in on the first day, you put it all in on the last day, as long as it's 10%, I don't care when it goes in. would probably be best to try and do it at 10% a month, but if you know that you have really, really sporadic income, you would want to give the low-income crowd and the self-employed, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to participate in this, so I'll just say 10% of annual income. The next question that always comes up about something like this is what happens to the Social Security contributions that that under 45 crowd has already contributed to Social Security? Do they lose that? The answer is no. You give them a Treasury bond for the amount of their current Social Security contribution. You have it mature at retirement age. It will be deposited into their Freedom account. It's a real security. It can be sold on the open market when you retire and thereby convert it to cash. Anyone at or over legal retirement age could retire if they had the minimum retirement equity, and that equity would be 4% of that equity would have to cover at least 80% of their inflation-adjusted average annual earnings for the last 10 years. Anybody whose freedom account equity exceeds 50 times the current median income could retire early. Anyone five years over the legal retirement age 
who has contributed 10% of their earnings for at least 20 years, for whom their account equity is still so low that 4% will not cover 80% of their earnings, they may request a one-time payment from the federal government to their Freedom account to bring the equity high enough to cover at least 80% of their inflation-adjusted average annual earnings for the last 10 years and then retire. Okay, upon retirement, first, as soon as you declare retirement, 1% of your account equity has to be set aside to pass on to your heirs. If you have any, you can do it tax-free. This is not about whether you want the kids to have the money. This is about making sure that everybody in the next generation has more than the preceding generation in their freedom accounts so that we can institutionalize generational wealth and get everybody over post-subsistence as quickly as possible. The next thing that happens upon retirement is you're no longer required to keep putting 10% of your income into the account. If you are an early retiree, you may withdraw up to 3% per year tax-free until you hit the legal retirement age. After that, all retirees who retire at or over the legal retirement age can use any combination of 4% withdrawals, buy an annuity, do programmed withdrawals based on your life expectancy earnings and freedom account equity. You are not required to retire if you don't want to. If you never declare retirement and just want to keep putting 10% of your income in and making those 5% withdrawals get bigger and just pass it on to your heirs when you die, feel free to do that. I guarantee you, you'll be a very popular ancestor. There's no minimum distribution requirement either. If you just want to take out 1% or 2% and not go the full four, it's up to you. Okay, that takes care of the young folks. What about the folks 45 or older? They would be given a choice. If you are very close to retirement or already receiving Social Security, you could keep your Social Security benefits under current law. You'd basically just be grandfathered in. Don't need to worry about it. If you are kind of on the borderline, you could use Social Security under current law as a guaranteed minimum and get a freedom account. In any year where your freedom account withdrawals were less than your Social Security, you could use Social Security to cover the difference for a guaranteed minimum. If you do that, though, you're going to have to do a 10% withdrawal tax until you hit life expectancy plus one year. That would be the life expectancy in the year you're born. The other option would be if you are really well set and you have enough equity before you reach the legal retirement age so that 4% would cover that 80% of your average annual earnings, you could opt out of Social Security entirely and just switch to a Freedom Account. Since Freedom Account managers would be in a very good position to get group deals on insurance, Freedom Account holders could also opt to pay a 3.5% disability insurance premium and an additional 3.5% health savings account premium and use the Freedom Account as a way to get a deal on insurance or disability. You would not have to do that, but they would be an option that could be made available. Okay, so how do we dismantle the welfare state and the welfare cliff? The basic idea is you create a freedom account for all current welfare recipients and you make the 5% withdrawal the means test rather than their income. You reduce the current benefits by 5% to fund the freedom account for all current recipients. New recipients, that would just be understood to happen. The 5% annual freedom account withdrawal will be subtracted each year from the annual value of their benefits. So it would be a very small drop at first as the accounts get bigger the 5% would get bigger and the reduction would get bigger, but it would be a gradual drop-off, not an immediate drop to zero. In any year where the 5% withdrawal exceeded the amount of any single benefit, you're no longer eligible for that benefit. And the Freedom Account distribution would be the last benefit removed. That's the 5% that's get put in the Freedom Account. That would be the last benefit removed, so the account always goes up. The other thing that we need to address here is that, one, you don't want to reward persistent need. You want to reward demonstrated improvement. If you're going to be letting people earn as much money as they want while on welfare, you need to also have a stick in there along with that carrot, which is every three months where you don't have income, your benefits get reduced an additional 2.5%. Works out to 10% a year unless you can show physical disability or mental disability. Much harder for a blind person to go out and get a job. The benefits adjustment also has to be acknowledged that these are market-based, which means they're going to fluctuate with markets going up and down. The 5% is going to get bigger and smaller, so the benefits will be going up and down, but the overall trend in the 5% withdrawal is going to be up, and that makes the overall trend in the amount of benefits paid for by the federal government go down. 
So over time, then, the 5% withdrawals wind up displacing welfare with tax-free cash income. They also reduce unfunded obligations as these accounts grow and the payments get shifted to these accounts and off the federal government. So what would these accounts invest in? I would go with any non-leveraged investment vehicles such as stocks, bonds, certificates of deposit, mutual funds, or ETFs, exchange-traded funds. Mutual funds and exchange-traded funds have the advantage of low cost and professional management. Index funds and index ETFs, along with robo-advisors, allow you to invest without having to pick individual stocks or evaluate fund managers. Freedom accounts would also empower voluntary charities in a very interesting way in that you could have what you might call a post-subsistence charity drive. Suppose that instead of a food drive at Christmas time, you had a post-subsistence drive. The goal would be we raise money to put X amount of dollars into the freedom accounts of some number of poor people whose income and freedom account equity were below a certain threshold. That would get them closer to post-subsistence, it would reduce welfare costs, it would reduce unfunded obligations, and it would be a nice way to put Congress on notice not to increase welfare spending. The big advantage with freedom accounts, and the reason freedom accounts work so well, is they put compounding to work for us rather than against us, which virtually all other welfare programs do, and especially the UBI. It gets us all the benefits of a UBI, plus a number of things that a universal basic income does not get us. Income mobility being the big one, they get us to zero poverty over time, and they make work optional over time, which a UBI does not do. Everybody could move up by getting any job, because any income stream, you put the money into this account, that 5% withdrawal is going to get bigger, this is the basic standalone version of this plan. We could integrate this into a larger economic platform to make it work even better and bring the cost down even more. Those videos are coming. Finally, it is possible to get to the same place a Freedom Account will get you using currently available taxable and tax advantage investment accounts. It is much harder because of the costs involved. I currently make not quite 20000 per year, but I have been building my own personal capital base using minimalism, saving, and basic index investing techniques that anyone can use. I am not a financial advisor, and I have not hit post-subsistence yet, but if you want to see what I'm doing along these lines, check out the Tradecraft Solutions playlist on this channel. You should see a link on the screen shortly if it's not up already. Welcome to new subscribers. If you do subscribe, do me a favor and let me know in the comments what prompted you to subscribe. In fact, if you're a current subscriber and haven't done that yet, please do that. And I'll try to concentrate more on those topics for episodes and help build this community by putting out more stuff that the people like. If you do subscribe, do click the bell icon so that you'll be notified of new videos when they upload. And until next time, may the balance of your day be awesome.